Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm your host, Mike Salitro, and tonight we are thrilled to be speaking with Richard Friesen. Richard works with professionals and business leaders who want to increase their personal effectiveness with joy and grace. His neuroscience-based mind muscles model gives his clients the opportunity to reach their goals with online training, simulations, interactive exercise, group support, and real-time decision processes. Richard has been a broker floor trader and built a solid, successful options trading firm and financial software, software company. He's also the inventor of 10 significant trading interface patents. This combined with his master's degree in clinical psychology and neuroscience focus brings a unique framework to business investing and career success. Rich is building a money positive community with his book, A Private Conversation with Money, and his online course. This book observes the main character, Joe, who deals with all the conflicts, self-sabotage, and belief systems around money and wealth. Rich, welcome. We are really excited to be speaking with you. Well, thank you. I'm just happy to be here. I've listened to some of your podcasts and the way you've got it structured with 12 questions, 30 minutes, it keeps it really precise, focused, and I believe that we're going to have a great time today. Well, thank you for saying that. And I will try to navigate us through those 12 questions better than I did through your bio. Uh, very impressive. And I, I I had difficulty reading through the whole thing because there's so many uh, things in there. When you meet somebody new, how do you introduce yourself or what do you tell them that you do or who you are? I just say, I'm Rich Friesen. How do you do? And then I start to ask questions. I start to connect with them so that I can connect with them in a way and with rapport with what they're interested in and what they value. If uh, I do say what I do, I say I'm a coach for people who handle money, deal with money, and want a better relationship with money. I like that. And where most of us, I mean, all of us deal with money one way or another, but I would say most of us are looking for a better relationship, whether we know mm -hmm. it or not. Uh, and kind of going hand in hand with that connection piece, how do you help people acknowledge, one, how to have that connection with each other and then to have a better relationship, that connection to money as well. Is it something that we can discover on our own and realize we need help or do we have to, do we need help seeing that in the first place? Well, I discovered it by a voice in the middle of the night. So there it's a longer story. I'll make it really short. <laughs> no, please, but, please. <laughs> it was April of 95. I was woke up in the middle of the night. A voice said, rich, you're only worth 200,000 a year. Woke up, looked around, wife was sleeping peacefully beside me, nobody else in the room. I showered, dressed, went to the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange where I was a market maker. I sat on the concrete steps, got there so early, it wasn't even open. And some backstory is I had gone on my own after uh, trading for a large arbitrage firm with with quants and people and support and computers and all that. And I was on my own. And the first year I was very careful. I made 125,000, then 150, 175, then 200, then 200, which brings us to April of 95. In the first month I made 200,000 because Micron had just taken off and there was just money all over the place. But when I hit that limit, I just went up and down, up and down, up and down. And so I walked into the pit I looked around. It was empty, of course, because the doors had just opened. And I decided rather than standing in the back, I went and stood right in the front between the two brokers in front of the book staff so I could hear all the orders. The guy who always stood there, and you got to understand, the pits can be a pretty tough and mean place. <laughs> he looked at me. He looked at the clock, about to go off. He tapped me on the shoulder. I didn't move. The whole pit went said, what the What's going on? They all kind of stood back because they knew what was going to happen. The exchange staff immediately warned us with a $10,000 fine. I stood there. The bell went off. And normally, Rich Friesen takes little orders, a little here, a little there. I went, buy 50, sell you 20, buy them, sold, sold, sold. I just went, the, the pit thought that I had gone berserk. But I went on to make many times that 200000 a year. But what's critical for the story is that voice woke me up. 
and said, you're only worth it. So I had this belief system that was holding me back. So then when I built a trading firm, third of the traders would make real good money. A third of them would do okay. But a third of them just couldn't make it. And I brought in a hypnotherapist. And we discovered that they only had their own limitations. So then the question is, how do you move from that voice in the middle of the night that was just quirky to intentionally making that change? That's a fantastic story. And thank you for starting there because I can only imagine where we're about to go. I have so many things I want to follow up on. Uh, first, was this the first time you heard that voice or is this something that was a, a repetitive? First time, to... only time, never since. Never since. And how did you know that you should listen to what was driving you that day when you to get up, shower and get to the, the pit before anyone else is awake? Well, that's the hard question, but it's the good question because that's the question I had asked. What created that voice? What was that warning? And I realized that something in me was just done with it. And I was so done with it that that voice in the middle of the night kind of reminded me, say, no, you're not done with it. I'm still here. <laughs> but I realized that I it, once it surfaced, so then my work and then in the private conversation with money and with clients is, how do we take something that was accidental and quirky and turn it into an intentional awareness, acceptance, and then asking, what do we want now? And so that has been my process. And that is, I've developed a number of paths and exercises and processes to take that mystery, expand it, understand it, and create steps. That's it's fantastic, for, for sure. And I love the way that you've systematized it and been able to roll it out and help others. Uh, when I was prepping and researching for our talk tonight, the word unique jumped out at me. And it's one of those that it's like, yeah, it, you know, it's possible, but probably there's somebody with a similar background or framework. Mm -hmm. But when I look at your background, I don't, I have, I, I get to talk to some pretty amazing folks here. I've never met anybody who has done uh, the work that you've done with the study that you've done and combined them building a timeline out here. When did you get interested in the mind, how it affects uh for you working in finance that, you know, I'm also interested in the psychology of this. Was this during your career? Was this before? When did that start? Well, after I graduated from college with a BA in philosophy, <clears throat> I realized that I really wanted to work with people and help them. So I went back to school, got a master's degree in clinical psychology and started as a family and group therapist. I uh, studied at the Gestalt Institute. And then a buddy of mine from college uh, was building a trading firm in options and futures. So he says, hey, why didn't you come and join us? And I thought, well, I, <laughs> what does Rich Friesen know about that horrible financial world? So I gave in and went to work for Merrill Lynch to get my feet wet. And then eventually I joined uh, CRT and Joe Ritchie, who's mentioned in a number of books, and he's in Wikipedia. And so uh, I went to work for him. And then work for myself and realized how much mindset and my psychology trading came into bear. And that allowed me to really build a successful trading firm because I focused on what really mattered. And that is the mindset that we bring to money and careers and success. So mindset is one of those things that I feel like we know what the word means. We understand how it has a relationship to our relationship with others, ourselves, the things that we do, the things that we accomplish, the things that we don't get done. Um, but I feel it's one of those things that you also will never fully comprehend, and it's a never-ending lesson uh, or things to learn about it. I also think that it's it's easily ignored by many. How, when you're working, especially with people in the financial field that are, are successful, they're confident, they know what they're doing, do you find that mindset is already a piece of that it's something that they have succeeded in spite of how i guess how do you get people to open up to the idea that thinking positively understanding how my thoughts impact my actions or or, or how they work together is important is that is that something that you've had i'm sure you've had luck with it but have you had people kind of shut you down there what does that look like when you start working with them yeah so i when people come to me for private coaching for example it's because they have an issue and they want the issue fixed. So I'll start a conversation with them. And what's the issue? 
And I'll say, well, let's go back to a time where that issue came up, where that behavior came up. Can you imagine it? How long ago? It was a week ago. Okay, let's go back there. What happened an hour or two hours before? And inevitably, we will come back to a point, that critical point where they go off the rails. They have an emotion. They have a feeling. So what I have discovered more and more is the truth is in the physiology. So when we go back to that point, I'm really pissed off. He said that, well, I'll say, notice your physiology. Uh, my breathing's tight, my throat's tight. I'm leaning forward, my shoulders are tight. My legs are bouncing up and down. Great, let's exaggerate that more, more, more. Can I talk to your physiology? If your physiology had a voice, what would it be? I'm really pissed off. I'm really angry. So by going through the physiology, we can often get to those deeper voices, those uh, needs we have, the survival mechanisms, the old behaviors, the thoughts in our head much faster than if we just do talk therapy. So, I mean, as you say that, that makes sense. And that's a, a way to get to the root of the problem. What what I think, my, even myself has probably, not a problem, but is difficulty wrap my mind around is that difficulty with money that is, is does this come from something we may not even realize that because when people think of money, generally more is what, what they're looking for. That if, if you ask, mm -hmm. I guess, 10 people, <laughs> probably 10 of them would tell you, sure, I will take more money. I would like more <laughs> yeah. money. You know, how to get it, that's a different question. But when we when you're having these conversations with money, what what is holding people back from you know, you, you talk your story is an excellent one to talk about that ceiling that you had placed without even realizing it. What what is keeping most people from achieving what they're looking for and why do they have a negative connotation or relationship with money in the first place? Well, there's a couple of uh, lenses we can look through. One is what was your father's attitude or your mother's parents' attitude toward money? For some, money is the root of evil. The wealthy people over there are taking it all and they're assholes. If you get wealthy, you'll become just like them. People who are in a group, a certain class. If you decide you're going to leave that class, you need to abandon uh, all the connections that you have. Oh, my gosh, that's really scary. Or we get to college into, and the beliefs of, you know, the professors there around money and wealth and politics and economics. And then we get to our cultural divide around money. You know, for some who think that money is great, other people say it's not proportioned properly. We need to reproportion it that wealthy people are really living off the backs of the poor. And so we have all these conflicting things from our very childhood all the way up to our more cultural belief systems. And they're just like all in there in the, all these voices and conflicts. So do we have clear energy about delivering value to others and receiving what I call certificates of appreciation? So what I do with my clients is I rephrase money, not as money and, and mansions and fancy cars or uh, trophy spouses and all that, but as delivering value to others. So Mike, if I deliver value to you, you say, thank you, Rich. Here is a certificate of appreciation. Wow. I look at this and I say, wow, I just delivered value to Mike and he gave me certificates of appreciation. I'm going to put them in my trophy case or in this case, a bank. <laughs> and, and so what we do is we, we take all these cultural belief family conflicts and we turn them into something that most good people can support and that's delivering value and receiving certificates of appreciation. So here's what's going to uh, blow your mind open. You ready? <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> the more certificates of appreciation you collect, the more value you have delivered. Now, Martin Luther King delivered tremendous amount of value and it had nothing to do with money. We can, as a father, I can deliver value to my kids and my grandkids. So there's millions of ways to deliver value, but we all want to do deliver value in a commercial world so that we can receive certificates of appreciation so we can take care of all those things that we're responsible for. So I, I certainly I follow 
the the path there with delivering value where mm-hmm. i think sometimes it gets difficult to, to kind of spin that forward the martin luther king example is a good one there are plenty of people who do very valuable work but are not compensated on a one to one or a like mm-hmm. scale and there and on the other side of that there are people who are not necessarily delivering a ton of value who may be, be doing well um how how well, i guess we'll start here you know, you were doing well you broke through a $200,000 a year uh, salary, which most people mm-hmm. would be very thrilled with. How did you kind of acknowledge that I can help others do this when I, I would think inherently some someone might think, I'm doing just fine. I, I have a great relationship with money. I've, I am now making more than I mm-hmm. ever thought I could. Why mm-hmm. was it important for you to help others see that there's this value exchange and there's a way to kind of break through ceilings as well? How did you come to that? That's a real personal question, Mike. <laughs> so, okay, I'll open the kimono. My father was an evangelical preacher, and his passion in life was to help others spiritually. Now, as I grew up, I'm no longer a religious person in the sense of uh, evangelicalism or any specific religious belief system, but I believe I have retained some of that just I just want the world to be a better place. I just want my grandkids to grow up in a wonderful world of hope and opportunity. And and now that I'm financially secure, I'm 76 years old uh, next month. So what can I do? I could watch TV all day. (laughs) Uh, But no, so making a contribution of all my experiences and what I've learned and and the truth is, I love my clients. I love working with my groups. I love the people that come to me. And we develop, I've developed friendships and relationships. And I've seen people just blossom. And I tell you, the reward for that is just terrific. And I make no bones about that. I, I can imagine. I see your I see your eyes just light up as you tell that story. So obviously you get a not only you're delivering value to your clients, you're helping them get to where they want to go, but it, it's it's a it's it's a rewarding experience for you as well because you're you're helping them do something that perhaps, at least if they could do it on their own, they probably wouldn't have done it as efficiently or as quickly had they had they had the opportunity. Yeah, well, to look kind what of... you're doing, Mike. You're bringing in people and sharing wisdom and knowledge, and you're making your contribution to making the world a better place. So I think that. If everyone had that, what if everyone woke up tomorrow and said, how can I deliver value to the world? I'm just going to find a specific set of people, a group of people. I'm going to look at my talents and skills, and I'm going to work. My life is about developing more and more abilities to deliver value. If everybody woke up tomorrow, almost all the problems in the world would be solved. It would be in a much better place if that was the case. It would be. (laughs) I'm not going to argue with you on that one at all. Uh, so I, again, I, you started us off with a very fantastic story about yourself and the pit and your realization with money. You've, you've written a book, which I want to ask you about, but is there a story that in, encapsula, really encapsulates how you were able to, to meld these two worlds that most, I, I guess most would say they're so different that I'm trading. I'm on the floor. It's the most competitive, ruthless, difficult mm-hmm. place to be. Yes. And now I also, I understand the inner workings of, of the mind. Uh, I'm philosophical. I, 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 I think about how things could be, should be, can be, and tying them together. Is there, is there a story that illustrates how you're able to tie those two worlds together so beautifully? Well, yeah, I think at my core, I'm a teacher. And if I look back at, from my earliest days, that's was it. When I got, and I'll use the word, sucked into the financial <laughs> world, it was because I had a buddy who said, Rich, come on, come on, come in this world. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so they put me in a what I think was an unnatural world for Rich Friesen. Now, uh, like I said, I had these internal limits and it took a while to break through them, but When I started building a trading firm and saw the issues that the traders I hired had, then it came very natural to take my experiences in psychology and bring them to help those traders fulfill their own dreams. And then once the trading floors ended, I started a software firm. 
And then uh, that was sold to Hitachi. And then now I'm looking at, well, what do I do? I have money, finances, psychology, philosophy. What What's the biggest problem in the world today? And I look at the cultural divide, especially around economics and money. But that's a big problem. <laughs> so can I really narrow it down and deliver a model for people so that they can have a rapport with money, a better relationship, take care of their financial situation, and do it by delivering value to others? It's, it's a good it's a, it's a it's an excellent foundation and a good way to help others for sure. I do want to follow up on one more thing before we get into the book. You mentioned when you started your trading firm, uh, when you started your firm with traders, that a third of them did well, a third of them did okay, and a third did not do well. Uh, I'm assuming that's not correlated to their skill, their effort. What did you find led to their results or was tied to their performance more than anything? That's, yeah. Well, for example, one of the traders, he was uh, brilliant. He came from West Virginia came from a whole clan of uncles and cousins and, you know, dozens of brothers and sisters. And you, you can imagine it, but absolute poverty. So when he came to the floor, he was smart and he wasn't thinking about it. And he just started making money. And then he started looking at his bank account and he realized how far removed, the, how that removed him from the connection with that clan back there. So he just started losing it. So under hypnosis, we discovered that and were able then to reframe his relationship as a wealthy person to uh, his lineage of poverty. Another one, his father was an immigrant, came here, worked two and three jobs to put him through a good school to give him every opportunity he had. And he hit a certain limit. And under hypnosis, we discovered that he's, and this is, you're not going to believe this. It doesn't make sense. But the internal voice said, if you make more than your dad who struggled so hard, you're disrespecting him. If you make money easily when he had such pain to make it, you are disrespecting him. And so his honor of his father was so great that he would rather not make money than disrespect his father. So everyone has a different story, different conflicts, different issues, different limits. And so the book is aimed and the exercises in it to expose those so you can make some better choices in your life. Okay, so let, let's get into the book then, A Private Conversation with Money. Why Why is why is it the title and how did you decide it was time to write it? Oh, I, <laughs> I looked around and saw all the conflicts my friends had with money, all the conflicts that I had, my own story, the story of my traders. And it just, it was like this inner drive. So I started writing it. And I it and I got some negative reviews from some well-known people. And so it went through three major revisions before I felt it was it could be released. But what I do is take the character Joe, and Joe is conflicted around money. He's got debts. He's a social justice warrior, a journalist, uh, is anti-wealth, anti-free markets. And so his struggles, his internalized beliefs, he meets the character Money, who shows up, by the way, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I borrowed that. <laughs> Scares the crap out of him. But they start having a series of conversations. And Joe pushes back and fights and, and does everything he can to hold on to his belief systems. But slowly, his belief systems no longer match reality. And he starts moving forward. And eventually, he finds in his own soul and his values that he wants to deliver value to children who are disenfranchised in the inner city. And he starts and works on a charter school. So he's learned, he freed himself from all this anger to say, how can I, Joe Every, deliver value? And he then in the book, he started making a huge difference in lives of kids that didn't have much choice. Excellent. Uh, I, I love that you've got the uh, story centered around a character, especially that he's borrowing uh, anecdotes from, from your from your life. So that's uh, that sounds yeah, like we, that... we all write about our lives. You know that you read nothing... the book, and you say, oh, there's rich. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Uh, the subtitle for the book, Experience the, Experience the Ten Keys to Financial Freedom. 
Um, how do you, uh, how, how are you able to learn those? And then how are you uh, teaching others about them through the book? Yeah. You know, I took, a, I've taken a lot of training in Gestalt NLP and plus my financial understanding, my work with my own traders. I have created uh, 10 exercises and the exercises are in an online uh, program. And in fact, if people go to conversations.money slash Mike's 100, they will have access to the course for free. So that takes them through all every major uh, impediment that people have in their beliefs around money. I go through them one at a time and the exercises bring these to awareness. And sometimes the exercises give you a behavior to test out to see if that feels better, honors your values and gets you to your goals. Very nice. I appreciate the, the gift to our audience. I'll be sure to post that in our show notes. Uh, Last question on on the book and kind of your your background with money. What you mentioned getting feedback that either you weren't expecting or negative feedback in the first few iterations of the book. Were you were you expecting that kind of response as it being the first time putting this these thoughts into a book, or were you caught off guard? And how are you able to work through those? <laughs> oh no, it? that first edition <laughs> that was glorious! <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Like when I first started training, uh, trading, my first trainer told me I was the worst trainee he had ever had. So I am used to going from the worst and being rewarded to getting to the best. So when that first happened, I went, oh, my God. So what I did is I created a group of people. And I have a huge mailing list. So I invited people to come and we would do a, a session of group workshops on Zoom and we would go through the book. And boy, did I get a lot of feedback. I mean, oh, and then I had a friend who uh, developed a more pro style, introduced Julie, the character, and I had two editors. The first one had a real problem because the book was so bad, <laughs> it was hard to edit. But the second one refined it and then uh, was I was uh, willing to put it out. But that came with a lot of input, a lot of criticism and a lot of changes. I know I said last question, but I need to ask, when you have a large audience like you do, who is going through a work of yours that's near and dear to your heart, how do you know which feedback is good, which is actionable, which you should follow up on, and that others like, well, that's I appreciate your opinion, but that's not really what I should be doing here. How are you able to decipher that? Well, I think the foundation is being not defensive. At my age, so what? <laughs> I am who I am. My wife's getting used to me being very honest about who I am, <laughs> what I'm doing. You don't like it? Okay, this is who I am. And I make mistakes. I say, oh, I screwed that up. I don't need to defend that. So when pe feedback comes from me, I can evaluate it. Well, not all the time, <laughs> but hopefully for the most part, for the information itself, rather than going and, and needing to defend myself. Because what I found is that my audience and the people who make feedback and comments is that they are purifying the book. Uh, my dad from the pulpit used to say that the only way you purify gold is to put it in the flames. And I've taken that to heart. And oh my gosh, have I had, I you know, there's probably 30 or 40 people listed in the book who gave me feedback. That's a good answer. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you have, and I want to ask about this. You've mentioned hypnosis a couple of times. Why do you think that works? And why are people so skeptical of it? Yeah, well, it's the brain and there's our survival mechanisms will not take us to a place that we haven't imagined, that we haven't felt is safe. I could give you examples in my own life. Like, for example, my belief about my financial limits. So what we do is we, like, for example, we'll uh, ask, like in, in a program called Alpha Presence I'm releasing soon, we'll ask people to step into the, and create the home of somebody who has the presence, the charisma that they want. And what's interesting as they approach the door in this guided visualization, some of them will back up and say, ooh, I'm not ready yet. Fine. 
So let's find out what stops you, what beliefs, what systems. We look back and see who's watching us. What are their criticisms? And then when we step in the house, we go through it and I ask, what are you experiencing right now? And they'll say, wow, this feels better. So as soon as we have that acknowledgement that this feels better, we still have all the neurological connections. We still have all the old stuff, you know, in our brains. But once we step can step towards something that feels better as versus willpower and discipline, then we can continue to make that invitation. That's a good answer. Thank you. Wrapping up, we'll, we'll end here. You mentioned you've got your 76th birthday coming up next month. What is next for you or what do you hope to uh, to do now that the book is out? You're getting uh, the positive reviews that you had hoped for. What What is next or what do you want to uh, start uh, start working toward? Oh, for the last six months, I've been working on a book called Healing the Political Divide. And again, I have a group of people that meets on Wednesdays and they are. I have a model, a thought of how we can just like changing money to certificates of appreciation. Can we create a model that makes a shift? Uh, you can just call me Don Quixote. <laughs> Man, I couldn't pick a bigger windmill. <laughs> but it's challenging me to, to the core of my being, how to communicate, how to make rapport with each other and our connections in this world when the possibility is that we are flying further and further apart. And so the, I look again at my the world for my grandkids and say, hmm, how can I make this very big problem better? Well, I give you credit, Rich. You take small problems and try to make them uh, Into big helpful. Problems. Yes, you know, trying to help people with with money and trying to uh, cure the political divide. <laughs> uh, those are those are very very large uh, very large issues to uh, and so I commend you on that. Uh, what what is wrapping up here? What is one thing I didn't ask you tonight that I probably should have? Oh my gosh! Yeah, the golden keys, awareness. Oh. Right now, my chest is a little tight. I notice my voice is a little tight. Acceptance, that's okay. I got, I'm got. i excited. Mike has been a great interviewer. This has been a thrilling time, so I'm a little hyper. So awareness and then acceptance. It's okay, Rich, that you know, you've know you gotten to a little bit of a hyper stage. And then I can say, now, what do I want? Oh, I want to be with Mike. I want to wrap this up beautifully. I want to be fully present with him. I'm noticing my voice is dropping down, slowing down. I'm now feeling appreciation for you, Mike, and what you've done and our connection in this short time. Oh, this is where I would rather be. So the golden keys are awareness, acceptance, and then asking, ah, what do I want now? Thank you for sharing that. That is a wonderful place to wrap up. We're going to post the uh the give the link to the course that you were so kind to give away to our audience in our show notes. So thank you very much for that. But if our listeners want to connect directly, learn more, where, where can they where can they find you, Rich? Always rich at mindmuscles.com or they can go to conversations.money. And conversations.money slash mics one hundred will get them uh, to a coupon and the free online course. Excellent. So we will post all that. Rich, thank you so much for speaking with us. This was a ton of fun and uh, hopefully, and I'm sure it is, a great lesson for, for those listening out there. I look forward to doing it again. Take care, Mike. You too.